Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Grand Rounds, Mount Sinai Morningside and West. Um, so excited for this talk today. Uh, I've been a big fan of uh, Dr. David Healy's for many years, having read uh, several of his books and learned a tremendous amount from his work. He is currently a professor in the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University in Toronto, previously professor of psychiatry at Bangor and Cardiff Universities in the UK, and former secretary of the British Association for Psychopharmacology. He's uh, been uh, researching and writing about the history of psychopharmacology and about adverse effects of treatment in, in many books and articles, including the antidepressant era, the creation of psychopharmacology, um, let them eat Prozac, Pharmageddon, and more. Um, and uh, really takes a, 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 a historical view and a behind the scenes view at pharmaceutical companies and the process of drug development and marketing um, that is you know, skeptical because uh, we need to be skeptical about, about these things and understand what, what goes on in the process also of, of the excitement of discovery as well as some of the overreaching of, of uh, pharmaceutical uh, discovery. So really delighted to have you here. We're going to have him talk and then open up to a discussion at the end. That's great, Paul. I'll hopefully be able to share screen. Um, it's great to be here. And uh, let me move on to the first slide, which may be one that's um, a little unusual for you when I say this is a suicide note. We don't usually get these at, uh, at the start of talks. When I call this a suicide note, uh, you, and when I say, which I will say later on, that the art of medicine is to bring good out of the use of poisons, you may think that I'm not in favor of drugs and I'm not in favor of the medical model. Quite the contrary. I'm a strong believer in the medical model, which of course is what helps us find physical treatments and often non-physical treatments also for the conditions we treat, but also teaches us when not to use them. This APA suicide note appeared in 2004, as you can see from the date up there in the right corner, when there was a crisis going on uh, that I'm going to tell you about. What I believe APA should have said was that psychiatrists and other clinicians can save lives. APA's note, unfortunately, sort of puts the magic of treatment in the pills, where I think it lies in us. The reason the pills have looked magical is that we're in an era where clinical care is being standardized and that creates numbers and the antidepressants are festooned with all kinds of numbers whereas your clinical judgment and mine isn't and because of that the antidepressants look scientific and we don't but as far as i'm concerned we're the scientists and i'm going to use a, a further word that practicing scientifically in the way that i'm going to talk about is also a moral enterprise now, i haven't used that word before in talks and it'll be interesting to see what you guys think of of its use the crisis that concerned the apa began 15 years before that when three clinicians two doctors one nurse uh, reported on six cases uh, people who become suicidal taking fluoxetine now in terms of the standard ways in clinical care to work out cause and effect, this article nailed it. There was very little doubt, but that fluoxetine caused people to become suicidal, as other SSRIs can. And 10 or 20 different groups, including Yale, who for once were agreeing with Harvard here, came out and said the same thing. We have seen uh, uh, the same thing. As did I, I reported on two cases of men who'd uh, become suicidal, when you remove the fluoxetine, the problem cleared up. When you reintroduced it, or, an, or another SSRI, the problem came back. And in that case, there was very little other way to uh, determine, or to, to, to explain what was going on, other than to say the drug could cause the problem. Now, in almost the same week that my article came out, an article came out in the BMJ from Eli Lilly, which is here, where they said, look, there's a number of reports around the place of our drug making people suicidal. But when we've analyzed our clinical trial database, we don't find that. And uh, so in essence, uh, the science is saying our drug does not cause people to become suicidal. The anecdotes, as they began to call them, say these things. But as they told us, the plural of anecdote is not data. 
it's the disease that's calling people, causing people to become suicidal, not the drug. And the challenge to people, to uh, the public, to doctors, to the media, to politicians was, are you going to believe the science are the anecdotes? Now, this essentially was the first article of the evidence-based medicine era. The usual histories of evidence-based medicine don't feature this article, but this really created evidence-based medicine in the sense that I'm going to be talking about it. My job here is to tell you that the original phrase was the plural of anecdote is data. And if that weren't the case, Google wouldn't work. Uh, while people who are uh, depressed do become suicidal, when you give healthy volunteers an SSRI and they become suicidal and commit suicide, I find it very hard to believe that the drug hasn't caused uh, the problem. Although companies can get experts to come along and say, no, 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 it must have been the underlying illness that we didn't know about. And what I'm going to put to you is that in actual fact, the evidence-based medicine, the science of what was going on was in the original Teicher article. And what you're seeing here is an artifact that what gets called evidence-based medicine is largely an artifact. This is an ad for Risperdal before it came out where Janssen are playing on the fact that they know we're all moving towards calling ourselves clinical scientists. And they're contrasting the art and the science of medicine, the art being the good bedside manner and something to do with uh, you know, the human sciences, which claim to be context rich. But they know that most doctors and other clinicians in the healthcare field are going to be figuring that it's more important to be confounder free and RCTs get rid of confounders. And that's the hard science. The contrast is between what I called evident, which you may not have heard about it, and evidence. I'm going to be saying to you that rest, depending on evidence, which is all about trying to persuade you not to believe the, ev the evidence of your own eyes, is going to alienate you from any possibility of a relationship-based medicine. Our myths of origin, the origin of any kind of science, including clinical science, goes back to 1660, when the Royal Society was created. And the ground rules of that were that they were not going to discuss theology or philosophy. They were only going to look at issues that could be settled by data. Whether you were Christian, Hindu, Muslim, Jew, or atheist, you had to leave all of that at the door and look at the experiment happening in the apparatus in front of you and come to a verdict about that. You could repeat the experiment, you could do all sorts of things, but you had to come to a verdict, and the group had to come to a common verdict. We usually talk about data when we talk about this history, and we leave out the word settled by data, which is the process of you coming to a verdict or a diagnosis. We also leave out an event that happened 40 years before that, when Walter Raleigh had his head chopped off, uh, for being too close to those pesky Europeans. And uh, after that, the legal system recognized that he'd been convicted on the basis of what began to be called hearsay. People who had said things about what he'd said and done, but who did not come into court to be cross-examined. And the legal system said, hearsay cannot be brought into trials from here on. The jury has to go on the evidence, what's evident in front of them. You get a group of 12 people who are Christians, Hindus, Muslims, atheists, and Jews, and they've got to leave all of that at the door and come to a verdict based on what they're seeing right in front of them. Now, this may not be true for all time. It may be provisional. We might reserve the right to say, well, if the facts change, we may change our verdict. But that's true of all science. Now, let's say 30 years ago, Paul had come to me, and he knew me, and I knew him, and I'd put him on Prozac. And he'd become suicidal and he came back a week later to say, you know, uh, I think I've become suicidal on this drug. Well, when Paul is in the office with me, I've got all of the data there. He is all of the data. I've got his prior history. I can look through any medical records that I don't have. I can do lab tests. I can do brain scans. I can, we can have a case conference with all of you there and you can ask them questions or you may have seen people who are on these drugs as well. And between us, we can come to a view about the likeliest explanation of what's happening here. 
uh, verdict, a uh, diagnosis. And if we conclude that the Prozac made Paul suicidal, we can report this to FDA, who the minute they get the report, take Paul's name off it and transform it into hearsay. If 30 years later, one of you listening now goes on one of these drugs and becomes suicidal and wants to take a legal action and tells the court, well, there are tens of thousands of cases of people becoming suicidal on SSRIs on FDA's website, which there are, the court will say to you, well, that's not evidence, that's hearsay. If, on the other hand, Paul and I had written up his case as a case report and sent it into a journal who published it, you would be able to use Paul and me as evidence. You'd be able to bring us into court in order to persuade the jury that other reasonable people believe and think the same thing can happen as you think has happened to you. So that's the evidence-based medicine side of things. I want to move over to the, to the evidence side. And the first randomized control trial was done by this man here. Uh, Tony Hill, or Austin Bradford Hill, as he's also called, who did a trial of streptomycin in tuberculosis. There had been a previous non-randomized control trial run in the Mayo Clinic three years beforehand, which found out much more about uh, as, as streptomycin than the RCT did. Here's Hill 20 years later saying, RCTs are useful, but, uh, you know, if you're going to play a good round of golf, you've got to have 16 clubs in the bag. Just because the RCT may be your favorite club, you're not going to play a good round of golf if you only go around the course with an RCT in your hand. And he's saying that actually our belief in controlled trials, which was small compared with uh, the belief we have in them now, uh, you know, he's hinting that it's gone too far. We've gone overboard. He is very much an evident-based medicine man. He's also a man who recognizes that RCTs do harm, but we can bring good out of them. They do harm in the sense that they create ignorance. We look at one point awfully closely, does this drug work for whatever? And at the same time, ignore the hundreds of other effects the drug has, but we can bring good out of that harm if we learn something useful about the drug. Now, there's a trial that happened five years before this bit from Hill that you see here, which was run by Louis Lasagna, who was the primary driver behind RCTs in the United States. He thought they were a good thing and more people should be doing much more of them. And he's the person who got RCTs incorporated into the 1962 Food and Drugs Act. And this was a placebo-controlled RCT of thalidomide, which showed that it was effective. It missed the fact that it causes nausea sexual dysfunction, agitation, suicidality, peripheral neuropathy. It's a very SSRI-like drug, and the RCT missed all of these problems. On a risk-benefit ratio, the way FDA operate now, this trial would have almost certainly ensured that thalidomide was approved back then, rather than it leading to the crisis that it led to. A lot of people believe that RCTs can uniquely determine cause and effect. So here's um, um, imipramine, which was the first antidepressant, the first of the tricyclic antidepressants, all of which were brought on the market without RCTs. They're more powerful drugs than the SSRIs. They can treat melancholia, which is a condition that is, uh, comes with a very high risk that people are going on to commit suicide. So even though no RCTs were done, if we do a thought experiment, we would expect the results to look something like this, that there will be more suicidal events in the placebo arm than in the drug arm, even though imipramine, as clinicians not encumbered by RCTs, within a year of its launch, we're saying, this is a great drug, which is going to replace ECT, but it also causes some people to commit suicide. So even though it does, in an RCT, it's going to look like a drug that prevents people committing suicide. In the case of the SSRIs, because they don't treat melancholia, the trials were run in people who are mild to moderately depressed, who are at low risk of going on to commit suicide, and the data looked roughly like this. Now, in these trials, uh, the SSRIs were often compared to a TCA, either imipramine or amitriptyline, and if you put them into the same trials, which they were put into the same trials, the results look identical to the SSRI results. So 
randomized control trials don't tell you what this drug is doing. There's a context, and the context is that these are not drug trials. These are treatment trials. And every time a treatment and a condition cause superficially similarly the same things, RCTs can't really tell us what's going on. A drug trial gets us further than a treatment trial. And these are the healthy volunteer phase one trials were done before these drugs came on the market when it became very clear that you had healthy volunteers going on to commit suicide, they had sexual dysfunction, and after exposures of only one to two weeks to these drugs, they showed withdrawal problems, which cued the companies about how to steer the treatment trials so that these didn't show up. Now, back around the time that APA were getting awfully concerned, the crisis about antidepressants was getting worse, and FDA had asked the companies to send them all the data on a adults and children. And this is a screenshot of a document from GlaxoSmithKline showing the results from their MDD trials. And I've just, just to make it a bit easier to read, I've put the data here on the bottom. And this looks terribly bad for the company and for Paxil. But randomization, rather than getting rid of confounders, can come to the rescue and introduce them. GlaxoSmithKline, rather knowingly, I suspect, did two clinical trials in people with what they called, who had what they called intermittent brief depression. That's borderline personality disorder, people who are much more likely to go on uh, 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 to a suicidal event than the average person. And again, in these two trials, the data didn't look particularly good for Paxil, as you see here. But there was a good reason for I mean, there's a good reason to do these trials for GSK in that if this SSRIs helped people with borderline personality disorder, this is useful to know. But there was another good reason to do these trials, which was when you add the IBD results to the MDD results, all of a sudden, Paxil becomes protective against suicide. Now, we can add 12 more suicidal events to the IBDD group, and Paxil will still be protective against suicide we can add 40 more suicidal events to the IBDD group. And it's only then that the company that GSK would be obliged to say, well, maybe our drug does cause people to commit suicide on the basis that the data has now become statistically significant. Now, the handy thing about this slide is it shows you these two lines. But in practice, we know that uh, you could include IBD patients in the MDD group uh, easily. They're depressed, they're anxious, they're suicidal. They could easily go into an MDD trial. And the point is, something like this can happen in every randomized trial where we're looking at a treatment in a condition that's heterogeneous, whether it's breast cancer or Parkinson's disease or back pain or diabetes or depression. Well, these are not pure conditions. And the people in them are going to respond differently because of the condition they have, so that both good and bad effects of the treatment can be hidden. And if you're in the business of trying to hide the bad effects, it's rather easy to do. So let me uh, pick up another aspect of RCTs. In the SSRI trials, more people died on the SSRIs than on placebo. We don't look at effectiveness. Are, are these drugs, are any drugs across medicine, are they saving lives? We look at surrogate outcomes, and in the uh, depression trials, it's the score on a depression rating scale, of which the most famous one was made by Max Hamilton, who you see here saying things that are interesting. This is 15 years after uh, the scale was made, saying that this is revolutionary. Uh, it's standardizing clinical practice, and this can have a good side, and the bad side. And here's the bad side. Hamilton appreciates that if you adhere very closely to the checklist, and you're in the business of trying to treat people who bring problems to you that they hope you're going to help them with for them to get on with their life, that the risk is that you're going to help them to get on with the life that Pfizer want them to live rather than the life they want to, uh, them to live, uh, they want themselves to live. And this happens because there's a whole load of items on the scale, like the suicide item, where you ask the question, you know, have you been suicidal in the last week since I saw you last? 
and the person says, yes, I've tried to commit suicide. So uh, you score a four. But you're not asked to make a judgment. Is it the treatment or the condition that's caused this? If it's the drug, then the score should be zero. If it's the condition and the score is going up because the drug isn't suiting you, the illness appears to be worse. And of course, the answer to that is to give more of the drug or add further drugs in, which Pfizer know well is likely to happen. That's why at an APA meeting some years later uh, that I was at, they have this advert for a symposium that they're going to run where, you know, it's clinical skills were a bit 20th century. 21st century doctors are going to want to use clinical scales, which are going to make them scientific. This, I think, also features in this article you may all have seen or read, uh, which recently appeared in the New York Times saying that teenagers these days are on 10 drugs acting on their mental health. And uh, everybody, the, even the New York Post agreed that this is what's happening and it's a bad idea. And all sorts of comments said the same thing. Nobody, I think, nailed how it's happening. And a little bit uh, of uh, the reason, one of the reasons I think is, you know, you have a teen like this who gets an SSRI, becomes suicidal, and she's told, oh, you are really bipolar, and we're going to put you on a mood stabilizer. And uh, we put her on an antipsychotic, and these cause everybody to lose focus a bit. So when she comes back a week or two later and says, you know, I'm doing well, but I've lost focus a bit, well, we fish out an ADHD rating scale, and she now has ADHD because of her loss of focus. And we tell her, you know, you've got ADHD, and we're going to give you a stimulant, which works in exactly the opposite way as uh, the antipsychotic. This is like putting your teenager on a weighing scale and putting two 25 kilogram dumbbells in her hand and then looking at the scales and saying, oh my God, you're overweight. We need to give you a drug to cause you to lose weight. You know, it's, it's as crazy as that. The industry know this well, and in the 1980s started treating our numbers rather than having us treat the person who's come to us. They gave away free instruments to measure our peak flow rates and our bone densities and things like that. And they now treat risk factors rather than conventional. I mean, they make the money from the treatment of risk factors rather than conventional medical illnesses. They make the money out of giving us problems rather than helping us treat the problems people bring to us. And uh, the weighing scales here brings the point out, I think quite nicely, which is the first weighing scales for humans in France were introduced 10 years before the first reports of anorexia nervosa. In the 1920s, weighing scales migrated into drugstores where they came with a plate on them, giving our ideal weight for our height and sex and eating disorders mushroomed in the 1920s. And in the 1960s, they migrated into our bathrooms at home and eating disorders exploded in countries that had weighing scales. Now, Weighing scales aren't the only cause of anorexia nervosa, but measuring is causing nerve, um, neurotic disorders among both doctors and patients. And there's a further factor that came into play during the 1980s, which is where well, once we had healthcare and your judgment calls were the jewel at the heart of healthcare, Healthcare began to transform itself into health services. And like any service industry began to get managers for whom your judgment and the idea that what you're trying to do was to bring good out of the use of poison or good out of a mutilation uh, at the way the surgeons do, doesn't compute. They don't want things that sound and look like that. Well, once you had been in the business of trying to manage the risks to patients from their condition, we ended up being in the business of trying to manage the risks that patients pose to organizations. At the heart of modern management theory is we manage what we can measure. And the figures produce a sheen of scientific gold, gold which in a modern version of the King Midas story uh, is leading to uh, the situation where we are killing healthcare. It's becoming unsustainable. So let me just switch gears uh, uh, slightly. I told you the Teicher article kicked the crisis off. 
This article made things much worse. This is study 329, which appears in 2001 in the journal with the highest impact factor in child psychiatry. It's got an authorship line to die for. It's a great study done in great centers with great doctors. So this is not a bad study. It claims Paxil works wonderfully well in teenagers who are depressed and is safe. You see from the bottom that the trial had essentially been completed in 1998. And internally in GlaxoSmithKline, the company had looked at it and decided our drug doesn't work and isn't safe, and we cannot publish that. We're going to pick the good bits of the study out, and we're going to publish them. And that's what you've just seen. Now, when this document came into the hands of New York State, they took a fraud action against GSK. And this document, which is, I mean, you've just seen part of one page of a six-page document here. Uh, when the um, when uh, later a few years later the uh, Department of Justice took an action against GSK and this document played a part, an action that was resolved for three billion dollars. Now, one of the fallouts from all this was with colleagues. A few of us got hold of the data from Study Three to Nine and began to write it up and publish what we thought should have been published in uh, the first instance, and finally was published in uh, the BMJ. Um, what we found was the first eight weeks, which the Keller Group had reported on, we couldn't find any way to show a difference between the three treatments, which were Paxil, imipramine, and, and placebo. Uh, we also published the six-month follow-up stage, which had remained unpublished 16 years later. And again, you couldn't show any difference. But the real interest behind the study, are uh, trying to restore uh, 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 the study, lay in the fact that in the original Keller paper, they referred to six children being emotionally labile. Uh, four of them looked like they were taking Paxil, and maybe two of those, as the small print hinted to you, uh, might have been suicidal. If you didn't read uh, the small print and just looked at uh, the kids being emotionally labile, and were working in the UK at the time, as I was, you might have thought, well, it'd be no harm if some of the English were a little bit more emotionally labile than they normally are. So you didn't really see a big problem. When we restored the study, we found that essentially 18 of the 92 children had significant behavioral events, most of which involved suicidal or homicidal um, events. This is one-fifth of the children uh, in the trial. Now, the adverse events, I mean, the interesting thing about the article, for, for me at least, was RCTs are the gold standard way to hide harms. The concluding sentences in uh, the paper are there on uh, the right, and you can read them. What I want to just quickly tell you about is three of the points that we outline in uh, the paper about how you can hide harms. One is the coding dictionary you used. When GSK called the suicidal events emotional liability, this was because of the coding dictionary they were using, which FDA didn't know about and no one else really knows about either, but it was legitimate if you're using this particular dictionary to use that term. Um, coding is the first act of authorship. Once that's done, the paper almost writes itself. One of the other trials I've looked at is you have a man who's on one of these drugs who becomes intensely suicidal, pours gasoline on himself, sets fire to it, and dies from his burns five days later. He's coded as death by burns rather than death by suicide. Now, given the background data that we had access to, we're able to see that uh, roughly 15% of the adverse events that the kids taking Paxil had did not get off the pages of the raw data and into the report that the company wrote about it or into uh, the Keller article. The Keller article reported on something like 250 adverse events in the children taking Paxil. We found there were roughly 500 adverse events. And you can't, in a paper, report all of these things. So you group them. You put the cardiac events into a cardiac group. You put the respiratory events into a respiratory group. And the behavioral events, well, you could do what GSK did and put them into a neurological group, which includes headaches and dizziness, which are awfully common. And all of a sudden, the neurological group looks the same, whether you're taking Paxil or Amipramine or placebo. 
or you can take them totally legitimately take them out of the neurological group and put the behavioral events in a behavioral group where all of a sudden the signal for the three drugs looks totally different. Now, this article had seven reviewers and went through seven review rounds and a year later was still not published even though the average for the BMJ is eight, eight weeks. And we were being held up not by the reviewers but by the research editor for the BMJ who's an awfully decent woman whose heart is in the right place mostly who as it turned out when we googled her because we just couldn't understand why she didn't want us to move the behavioral events out of the neurological group we found that she's a neurologist with expertise in headaches who's run trials for GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, but that's not really a problem. I've run trials for GlaxoSmithKline, so you know you can't blame her for that. Uh, the interesting thing was that her husband is a lawyer who works for Ropes and Gray, who are the company who defended GSK in the action that was resolved for $3 billion. When we pointed this out, all of a sudden our article ended up in print. You can get the full story, including the document you've seen earlier and the one you're about to see in uh, restoringstudy329.org are in this book, which also tells you the story and gives you most of the details of uh, the reviews and things like that. Now, this is a 2002 approvable letter where FDA are approving Paxil for children. They write, we agree with you, GSK, when you told us that study 3 to 9 was negative and that the other ones you did in children who were depressed were also negative, uh, but we're still going to approve the drug. And we agree with you that it would also not be useful to describe these negative trials in the labeling of the drug. What is going on here? Well, some of you will know, maybe all of you know about Eric Turner's famous 2008 article where he showed the publications for the antidepressants we know and love that are used for adults look like this. Uh, the drugs look wonderfully safe and wonderfully effective. Um, but Turner also had access to the reviews that FDA had done of these articles. And it becomes clear once you have those that there's a number of trials that FDA viewed as negative that were not published, but also a large number of trials that FDA viewed as negative that were published as positive. One third of the positive trials FDA had viewed as negative, like study three to nine. And the companies and FDA must know that if FDA put their view in the label of the drug, the companies are going to be sued for fraud. Uh, so, and this must be playing, you'd have to think this must be playing some part in what's going on. Before we address the question of, well, what is FDA's job? Let me quickly show you this which is that um, Pfizer had done four trials of Zoloft in PTSD, all negative. Zoloft was approved for PTSD from, on the back of two trials where there was a marginally positive result in the women in the trial, not the men. Uh, nevertheless, it got approved and two papers are have been written. One will go to the New England Journal of Medicine and the other to JAMA, as you can see there under status. And on the left-hand side, you can see authored TBD. TBD stands for to be determined. The papers are written and Pfizer's marketing department will determine who the authors on these papers should be. And FDA don't say anything about this. So what is their job? Well, maybe this audience won't know, but 50 years ago, the United Kingdom joined the European Union and immediately ran into problems. The European regulator told them, you can't call your favorite chocolate, Cadbury's chocolate, you can't call it chocolate. It hasn't got enough cocoa solids in it. The Brits were totally consternated at this and it set up the problems about red tape and regulation that caused them to leave the European Union 50 years later. This is not something you're normally told about Brexit. Um, what's going on here? Well, the, the name FDA gives it away. The FDA are a food and drugs regulator. They regulate what standard you need to meet in order to call your product chocolate, or what proportion of animal fats you need in a lump of yellow stuff that looks like butter in order to call it butter, or what standard you need to meet, which is a two or three point drop on a Hamilton rating scale to call your product an antidepressant. They are not saying 
this is good chocolate. They don't make any statements about that. They don't make any statements about butter being good for you or not. And they don't police the medical literature. This is some years later in the United Kingdom where the NHS is falling apart as it still is. But in the midst of it all, children's mental health is being recognized by the Minister of Health, you see here, as the spot in healthcare provision that's probably the worst of all. And this is not surprising when you think the 2004 crisis that APA uh, were actually concerned about. One of the things that showed up at that point was that there were 30 trials of SSRI and related drugs done in children, all negative. Now, you may say to me that FDA approved Prozac. They did. FDA also viewed the Prozac trials as negative on their primary outcome, as they did the Paxil trials and were happy to approve Paxil. Prozac had been approved before the crisis blew up. And that's, as far as I can make out, the only difference. The trials are negative. In fact, there's more negative trials on Prozac in teenagers than on any other SSRI. Um, so when you've got a situation where the published literature and the guidelines say SSRIs are the treatment to use, and the gap between what the science says and uh, the published claims are, which may be the greatest in all of science, it's not a big surprise that children's mental health is a disaster area. But this is not just an antidepressant story. It's not just a mental health story. This applies across medicine. It's not specific to us. In our case, it has led to a change in the way children and teenagers are treated. When I was a teenager, everybody thought you were going to go half mad uh, as a result of being a teenager and facing a crazy world. And it was thought that it was a good idea for us to work through this. You couldn't, I mean, you could then say, as Bart is, as Homer is saying to Bart here, that, you know, this is sensible um, advice, young man. Uh, what would happen now, of course, is you'd get a rating scale which would show that uh, you were half crazy and you'd be brought along to a doctor who would say, we have wonderful treatments that can help you. And the intriguing thing is Greta Thunberg's generation have done so much to warn us about the problems of chemicals in the environment. But this is the generation who are pumping more chemicals into their inner uh, environment, if that's not a contradiction in terms, than any previous generation in human history. And they're likely to give out to us if we try and say to them that taking pills isn't a good idea. And a little bit about what's going on uh, will um, uh, become clear now soon. I just want to take you to this slide for two points first, one of which is if you broke a limb and went along to an ER department and they told you they were doing a randomized control trial and they were going to randomly apply a plaster cast to one of your four limbs, not necessarily the broken one, the plaster cast would be placebo. Practicing on the basis of randomized control trials in this case, even if they are positive, unlike the SSRI trials in kids, isn't particularly intelligent. The other point I want to tell you about, which you don't see in this slide, is that we've each got four limbs. You only see two here, but we've got four. Uh, and how does that apply? Well, if you've got a patient who's constipated, there's four different kinds of constipation. And there's four different kinds of therapeutic principles that you can use. FDA licensed companies to use the word laxative, which conceals the fact that there are four totally different kinds of ways to treat the constipation. And the clinical skill depends on knowing which of these therapeutic principles is going to be suitable for the patient in front of you? Get it wrong and sort of perhaps end up with a patient on four of them and you're going to create treatment resistant constipation. The same holds true for antihypertensives and hypoglycemics and pretty well all the drugs we have, which is there's at least three and usually four and often more than four therapeutic principles in all these cases. But the word antihypertensive gets in the way of you recognizing this and making the judgment call about, well, what therapeutic principle do I need to use in the case of the patient right in front of me? This is true of the antidepressants as well. I could add a few other therapeutic principles, drugs that do just as well in getting people who are depressed well as any of the ones you see here. Uh, the SSRIs are anxiolytic. 
they're not going to be suited to old people. They don't work for melancholia. The TCAs do work for melancholia. They have a therapeutic principle involved in them that the others don't have. They're also anticholinergic. And I don't know how many of you know that anticholinergics are euphoriant, which might be a good therapeutic principle in a number of cases. Companies have made over $100 billion from these drugs. And it's been in their interest to make sure that you don't think about therapeutic principles. You just think about magic bullets that are going to restore a chemical imbalance. And they're all essentially going to do the same thing, uh, which is what the clinical trials lead you to believe. They don't reveal the fact that these drugs are acting in very, very different ways. It's our job to know this and to be able to use it in a clinically skillful way. Uh, just treating people with an antidepressant and then adding antidepressants because they didn't respond to the first one will create treatment-resistant depression. Now, let me take you to quickly to a few people I had some years ago. One was a lady who took an SSRI and became alcoholic. She um, reported to her doctor and AA when she was later referred there, you know, I think this SSRI is making me alcoholic. And the doctor and AA said, this is typical alcoholic thinking. This just proves you're an alcoholic. She had no background in healthcare. She dropped out of school early. I've got a PhD in the serotonin system. I met her a few years later and she taught me things about the serotonin system that I didn't know about uh, and showed me that the pharmaceutical industry recognized, they were the only people that recognized what she was talking about and were working on treatments for alcoholism based on exactly what she had come up with. This taught me that motivation is often worth more than expertise, that we can, rather than have 100 heart sink patients, we can have 100 free research assistants if we approach the job properly. The next case is a man who had OCD, and for his job, OCD was really crippling, so we needed to get him well. I gave him the usual SSRIs, antipsychotics added into it. None of these helped him. They made him worse. And one week he comes back, and he's clearly much better. And he's slightly embarrassed to tell me that he stopped all the drugs that he was on. And that's not why he's better. He's better because he went back smoking. And he didn't just go back smoking. He went on the internet and Googled nicotine for OCD and finds those trials showing that nicotine has a decent treatment effect size in OCD, as good as SSRIs. And so as have nicotine-related drugs, like the ones we use for Alzheimer's often. What you've got here is a different therapeutic principle. What you've also got here is a man who, well, you've also got here, when I use the phrase, you know, the art of medicine is about bringing good out of the useful poison, people hiss at me, doctors hiss at me. But everybody would agree that in this case, this man is bringing good out of the useful poison. Uh, SSRI is on prescription only because we've every reason to think they're more dangerous than nicotine and alcohol. The other point I want to make is this man is the only person who's in a good position to make a benefit risk ratio decision about what's going on. You and I might help him with it, but FDA aren't in a good position to tell him, you know, uh, that there's a favorable or unfavorable benefit risk ratio here. But when FDA approved drugs these days, they claim to be doing it on a benefit risk ratio basis. They've approved SSRIs on the fact that there's a benefit, a mood effect, and all the risks are uncommon compared to that. And we don't want to put you off getting your SSRI by warning you about the hazards of treatment, when in fact, in the SSRI trials, knowing there was a sexual problem with the SSRIs, companies knew not to ask questions. And so the trials missed the fact that the single commonest thing an SSRI does is within 30 minutes of your first pill, it makes you genitally numb or irritable. It affects the way all of us make love when we go on them. And we're usually thinking, well, it's going to be good to get off these pills and everything will go back to normal. But we now know that in a significant proportion of people, they get post-SSRI sexual dysfunction, which means they may never be able to make love again in their life. Now, I believe patients with our help are in the best position to make a benefit-risk ratio decision, a much better position than FDA. Why is anyone paying any heed to FDA? Well, 
Paul Lieber, who used to work as the head of the CNS division in FDA, said it's because of delegated narcissism, narcissism that we all want a father figure or a god figure who's going to stabilize the system and make sure that things don't go wrong. And for some strange reason, FDA have ended up in that position um, when we, we don't want to recognize that it's our judgment calls that are the key thing in what happens. Instead, we're asking a bureaucrat whose job is not to think, it's to tick boxes that a company has met an assay standard. It's not to make a judgment call about a benefit risk ratio in clinical cases. That's our job. But the problem is that our judgment calls have become a problem for the healthcare systems we work for. The system we have can't embrace the idea of us bringing good out of the use of poisons. They want us to be delivering sacraments, which are things that can only do good. And we have changed from being specialists who knew a lot about the human body and, uh, and even more about one particular bit of it into partialists who know our little corner. But if anything turns up which affects many bodily systems, we're lost. We don't realize that this is a great indicator of a toxic effect of some sort. Drugs don't just go to one system. There's very little serotonin in the brains of any of us. It's, it's in the rest of the body. And this brings me to a point, <clears throat> which is um, we used to put poison symbols on medicines, our very, very strong warnings on them. And we stopped doing that. Um, we've now got serious proposals to stamp antidepressants, which do cause birth defects, uh, with a symbol of a pregnant woman to try and overcome the hesitancy pregnant women have about taking an antidepressant. And up on top, you've got some German where uh, this is Paracelsus's famous phrase about which becomes the art of medicine is bringing good out of the use of a poison. The interesting thing about the phrase here is that the German for poison is gift. So you could say, beware doctors bearing gifts. I used to, This is the first time I've used this phrase, and this is where morality comes back into the talk. I used to have just the two women on the left, and one's a doctor, one's a pilot. They both got adverse events reporting systems. When the pilot reports something going wrong, the system responds because they know that she won't fly again unless the changes are made. And she won't fly again, not just because the people on the plane will be dead if the plane goes down, but she will be dead too. Doctors report these things, and as you hear, FDAs have transformed it into hearsay, and nobody pays any heed to what doctors report. Of course, if the patient goes down, everybody blames the illness, nobody blames the doctor who continues to collect her high rates of pay, regardless of what happens. On the right, you've got um, Jane Fraser, who's the CEO of Citibank. And she came into a prominent uh, position there during the financial crisis. And in the financial crisis, as we look back on it, people are very happy to say, what you've got is, Bankers outsourcing risks. You know, they knew they were dodging mortgages, but they could get away with giving mortgages to us. If things did go wrong, we were the ones who would have a problem, not the bankers who would continue to collect their bonuses. This is a situation of moral hazard. And the situation of doctors is very similar. We outsource risk. There's no problem to us if things go wrong. This is a morally hazardous thing. Uh, state to be in, which makes it harder for us to do the right thing. The crisis that led APA to write a suicide note, this is 2004, was on the front pages of US news, which is not about do antidepressants cause people to commit suicide. It was about the fact that APA, um, US news and other groups were recognizing that if the pills work wonderfully well and are free of hazards, who needs doctors? Nurses are going to be cheaper prescribers than doctors are. To hang on to a clinical job, that is, if you like clinical practice, we've got to re retain our saltiness, which is we've got to be able to say to managers and insurers and others that we are bringing good out of the use of a poison. And this is risky and stressful. And, you know, we aren't going to be able to do this job if you insist on paying us nothing. 
the Institute of Medicine, 20 years, a little over 20 years ago, recognized this problem that treatment-induced death and injury was becoming an increasingly common form of death and injury. And things have got worse since then. The New York Times here reporting before COVID, COVID is playing no part in this. No, and neither COVID nor the vaccines are playing a part in the data you see here. But over the 40 years since industry turned to treating risk factors rather than diseases, and since we got managers in health services, life expectancy in the United States has been falling uh, much more than it's ever fallen before in recorded human history. I would put this down to polypharmacy. You may not, but I want to compare arms, guns, and drugs. They're both techniques. In the case of techniques, they're amoral. Whether the morality lies in us, if we can use them to enhance uh, the situation in people, that's good. If we use them to diminish people, that's bad. Arms, uh, arms and drugs create an arms race. The country with the best guns wins. Uh, the country with the best medical guns also wins, the one that can prevent uh, its troops dying from diseases. So the military has played a huge part in the arms race in both armaments and in healthcare. Their involvement has driven a lot of the developments we have in healthcare. The nuclear bomb shows us there's a limit to effectiveness. We can reach a point where our arms are so good we can't use them. Similarly, I think we've reached that point in healthcare with polypharmacy, as you'll see. But one more point. There's a difference between arms and drugs in the sense of the arms are getting more and more effective, the drugs aren't. They're often getting weaker and weaker across medicine, not just mental health. What's getting more and more effective is the propaganda that these drugs are better. And with better and better propaganda techniques can only diminish us. They can't enhance us. Life expectancy in the United States, and this is data from six years ago, 40% of over 45s run three or more drugs. 40% of over 65s run five or more drugs. We know that once you get over three, probably, and for sure five, that life expectancy falls. And if we can reduce your medication burden, we're going to improve your life expectancy and reduce the rate at which you go into hospital and improve your quality of life. We have reached a point where we've reached a limit to effectiveness. We've reached a point where choices and judgments are needed, as this still from the hurt locker mover, I think, brings out, which is if you're trying to deprescribe, taper some of the meds that a person's on, if they're on 10 or whatever, this is extraordinarily tricky. It's not an easy job to do. Things can blow up in your face. What you do for one patient might not work for the next. No RCT, our guideline, is ever going to be able to tell us what to do. It's going to be up to our judgment call and the, uh, the patient's judgment call. It's going to be up to our clinical experience, what's worked in the past and what hasn't. It's going to be up to us learning from our colleagues also who've been in the same kind of situation. If in a bid to be salty, you start reducing medication burdens, you're likely to find out how the system's structured, which is it's not going to think this is a good idea. Certainly in a system like the UK or uh, the Canadian system that I'm in now, which is a public health system, which in order to give the wider public the benefits of wealth is insists that we have to give you more pills and more services and more labels than you ever had before, that trying to restrict these things would go against the whole ethos of trying to level things up. If you want to reduce medication burden these days, you now have to be wealthy and go privately. Before, in order to get treatment to save your life, you had to be wealthy. Now, in order to get off treatment to save your life, you have to be wealthy. And the Canadian situation has got to an extreme, which is, We've endorsed medical assistance in dying, and I'm not anti this. Uh, you know, I ha have referred a patient for this. We've now got close to the highest rates in the world. In some of the other countries where this is happening and where they permit mental illness uh, into the frame, young women are getting referred for MAID for treatment-resistant depression. And when I say young, I mean in their 20s. Um, 
But the point I want to make here is not that. This is not a moral point about made. This is about the fact that you can get any service you want in Canada up to medically induced death. But what you cannot get, what there is no clinic for, is a service where you want to get off the services that you're currently having. It's just not possible. Now, I mentioned a hot sink lady who had an alcohol problem before, and that's an awful word to use. And what was great about her case was it introduced me to the idea of free research assistance. So this is a lady who could be a hot sink patient coming along. She's, you know, you've kept the guidelines and she's not getting well. She's not a hot sink patient. She's a lady from an Arthurian legend. King Arthur is out one day and he meets a black knight who challenges him to a duel and beats him and is about to kill him. And he thinks, oh, wait a minute. I've got a riddle for you. What do women most desire? When you come up with the answer to I mean, if you can come up with the answer to that and meet me back in a year's time, you can go free. If you don't have the answer, I'm going to kill you. So Arthur and his court spend a year looking for the answer and don't have one and are riding back for Arthur to meet the Black Knight uh, when they meet this lady by the edge of the road who says, I have the answer to the riddle that you've been asked. And she says, but for you to get the answer, you've got to give me one of your knights as my husband. And Sir Gawain jumps down and says, uh, I'm happy to be this lady's husband. So she gives him the answer and Arthur gives the answer to the Black Knight, who is not happy that he's not going to have the chance to kill Arthur. But Arthur and his troop get to go back to the court with the lady. And a few days later, Gawain and the loathly lady, as she's called, get married. And you see the court are unhappy here and they're wondering what's going to happen when they go up to the bedchamber. And they go up to the bedchamber and and Gawain can't bear to look at her. She takes control of the situation and he finds that she's one of the most attractive women he's ever seen. And uh, she gives him a riddle, which is, would you want me to be like this when we're in the bedchamber uh, together in the evening and the way I was in the court during the day? Or would you like me to be like this in the court during the day and the way I was in the bedchamber with you in the evening? which he can't answer, and he says, well, whatever you want, which turns out to be the right answer. She, like us, wants to have control over her own life. She might come to us with a problem for help, but she doesn't want to be told how to live life. She may be living life much better than any of us are. The point here is, if you look at and listen to your patient, this is the only scientific way to treat patients. It's not looking at the evidence base, which is all ghostwritten. It's not looking at the computer. It's looking and listening to her very, very closely and helping her solve a problem she wants solved. It's a relationship-based medicine. It's a medicine that doesn't alienate you from her or from anyone else. It's a relationship that creates an us, a community. What we call evidence-based medicine creates a false we. It creates an average, non-existent person. And if you start relating to that person, you're not going to be helping the patient in front of you. You're in, when a patient has been put on a drug like me putting Paul on a drug, we're in the Royal Society in 1660. Paul is the apparatus in which the experiment is happening. I should be leaving the Bibles and the Korans and the evidence based medicine, the New England Journal of Medicine, and the BMJ at the door. That should not be influencing me or anyone else who comes to look at the problem that he's having. We're being called upon to produce the best possible diagnosis that fits what we're seeing right in front of us. We can tweak the apparatus, we can ask them to reduce the dose and things like that, but at the end of the day, we've got to try and explain what we're seeing right in front of us. That's clinical science. Doing anything else is causing problems, but it's going to take a great deal of bravery for us to go there. The benefit of it is we'll have less hot sink patients and we'll have more free research assistance than we had before. And we're not just going to find out things, but people are going to get on better than they have been getting on. 
Thank you very much. That, oh, hang on, one more slide, which is just, if you want to hear the background history of all this, it's in a book that came out recently called The Shipwreck of uh, the Singular. I've told Paul I'm going to be sending you all, all of the slides and the text that goes with this, but this is the book and those are at the websites where um, you can find out more. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for uh, a very uh, provocative, stimulating, engaging talk. Um, I, I want to have a few questions, but I want to open up first to others and see if anyone would like to either chat or or unmute yourself to ask a question of Dr. Healy. Um, any, we welcome residents, trainees first, if, if anyone has one. Hi, Dr. Healy. Um, thank you for such an interesting talk. I'm curious if, if you're familiar with Judea Pearl's Book of Why and his ladder of causality, I wonder for psychiatry what you might think are options beyond clinical trials. Yeah, um, well, first of all, uh, that's a great talk. And perhaps the best way to explain it is I'm due to be giving a talk in a few weeks time and I'm hoping to go for, uh, to um, record it and I'll get the link of that talk to you. It's to, uh, talk to a bunch of lawyers and it's going to go into the RCT issues. What do they show and what do they not show? Okay. Now I haven't read the Pearl's book, uh, so I can't really address the points that he makes. My um, point though really to you is that you should leave all books at the door. It's worthwhile to read them. Okay. It's worthwhile to listen to me, but a good doctor is someone who has a relationship with a patient, you know, that you get to see them over time. You don't just get to see them once, that you get to see them over time. And if you're really good, not just mental health, but if you're really good, you can not just look at them and listen to them, you can smell them and smell a difference. You know, the person in front of you is all of the data. When Paul goes on Prozac and becomes suicidal and is in with me, I have all of the data right in front of me. And the challenge is to work out what's happening, Paul. And there's no book around the place that's really going to help me do that. The best way to do it, if I don't have a good sense of smell, is to get colleagues in perhaps who do have good sense of, a, a good sense um, of smell. And I say that not facetiously, because patients not uncommonly, if you let them, will say, when I went on this psychotropic drug, my smell changed. Or my wife or my husband told me my smell changed. These, these are real effects. Uh, in a different talk, I have Donald Trump and his hair. Finasteride causes hair replacement in young men who are losing their hair. Donald's a young man still, and he thought he needed finasteride and apparently is on it still. Uh, you know, it also causes people to become suicidal. It causes people to be unable to make love and may not ever be able to make love again. And when you look at the genes uh, that are expressed when you're on this drug, there are 3,500 changes. The clinical trial, any good clinical trial, will only look at one thing. It'll measure closely the number of hairs in his head and after treatment, see if he's got more hairs than he had before. It's generating ignorance about everything else these drugs do. The companies say, if he said he'd become suicidal, they say, our drug can't cause that. Or if he isn't able to make love, they'll say, our drug can't cause that. And all of the other things. There's, there's, you know, there's no book that's going to, it's as Paracelsus said, he, I mean, he also talked about poisons. But he also said, uh, our books are nature. In our case, our books are the people that come to us. I'd like to ask a question to follow up on that. So I, I guess what I'm wondering is, so where should we find the best information? Because if we just rely on one patient in front of us, we are going to come up with wrong conclusions as well. We're going to have some good conclusions, perhaps, and some wrong conclusions. One person got better, you know, spontaneously, mm -hmm. despite, you know, giving them ivermectin for their COVID or, you know, all kinds of different distortions of data if we are sure. just using ourselves. Sure. Um, so yeah. Where can we get the best information? We're not in control of the studies. Yeah. No, no, um, no, sure. Absolutely. No, no. And I'm not saying don't do randomized control trials. Okay. And when it comes to the claimed, 
benefits of treatment, like ivermectin for COVID, for instance. That's a really good example. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it works or not. I'm not advocating any treatments for COVID, okay? So I've got no skin in that game. Um, what you've got, when it comes to the benefits, part of the reason to do controlled trials and why Tony Hill did the first randomized controlled trial and why other people had done clinical trials, you know, other groups of doctors had got together and say, we need to evaluate these new treatments that are proposed for tuberculosis. We've had lots of treatments proposed for that before, where people have spent lots of money on them. They haven't worked and they've been hazardous. We need to evaluate the new kid on the block. And in the case of, of streptomycin, they concluded, the Mayo Clinic concluded that it works like the MRC randomized trial concluded. The Mayo Clinic said it works, but it, you develop tolerance quite quickly and you can go deaf. Now, the point is, I think we all recognize because of the hopes people have uh, that a treatment is going to work, that we do need to um, evaluate it in a particularly skeptical way. We need to be pretty rigorous. If it works unequivocally well, I mean, in the case of SSRIs, companies could have brought these drugs on the market in even just healthy volunteer trials, which lasted only a week, which would have had a much bigger differential between the drug and placebo if they had just tested, do these drugs have an anxiolytic effect? That shows within hours of your first pill. So you can run trials that, you know, well, you don't need them to be randomized. You know, you can say it's very, very clear from taking these. I mean, we ran a healthy volunteer trial on SSRIs and the patient I mean, on doctors and nurses and the patients in the ward uh, who didn't know the trial was going on and didn't know that some of my clinical colleagues were on an SSRI were able to say within 48 hours, is that man on something? He's looking much more mellow than usual. You know, so things like this are terribly obvious. What's happening in the case of the SSRIs, eyes, the companies couldn't bring them on the market as anxiolytics that you couldn't get hooked to, which is what they would have wanted to do. They decided they had to call them antidepressants and the antidepressant effect is pretty minimal and takes a long time to show up. So in order to work out, is it there at all? It's useful to have a randomized trial and have a, an intent focus on that, and you find out, well, maybe there is an effect. I mean, what you're finding is that maybe this could be useful in the case of people who are depressed. The idea of calling it an antidepressant, which uh, implies it's going to work across the board for people who are depressed, is kind of all wrong. So just like Bradford Hill said, you don't want just one golf club in uh, the back. I agree. You don't simply want your interview with the patient as the only tool you have in the back. You want clinical experience, which is having interviewed hundreds of patients. You want colleagues you can talk to. And um, these are also very important clubs to have in the back. Thank you. Other questions? Dr. Jang. Hi, I'm David, one of the um, outpatient uh, attendings. Thank you for a great and thought-provoking talk. Um, so, you know, there's this whole psychedelic kind of revolution that's happening, and there's a lot of um, pharma-critical, like, in culture and perspectives from that, the underground of that community. Um, I guess from your perspective and thinking about the themes of this talk, what are the caveats and concerns that we should have in mind as psychedelics makes their way through the FDA, you know, just based on the little that I know from some colleagues of mine that are in that space, I guess I would worry about the, sh the sort of shuffling of us towards patentable molecules and, you know, and, and a bias away from yeah. things that no one can make money from. But, but, you know, but do you have any thoughts on that? And yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, I have a book in which I, gave an answer to that question, which was, you know, we've got every reason, well, maybe not a great answer, but an answer, okay, which is every reason to think these drugs can be useful. The problem with them is, and it's disappeared during you know, the 1960s, 1970s, the problem is that industry can't standardize them the way they can uh, actually standardize antidepressants and antipsychotics and things like that. Uh, and I kind of said, you know, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. It, um, it, it, it upturns the industry model. But it's clear that because they haven't been able to find new antidepressants, 
uh, or any new drugs at all, really, that they've turned uh, uh, to uh, 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 the psychedelics. And the big problem, of course, is that, um, you know, uh, if you give ketamine, I am in you know, 100 microgram dose, whatever it is, uh, to people who are profoundly depressed who otherwise need ECT, you can get them well after one dose. I mean, get them well. Uh, this happening with an old cheap drug is the kind of thing we should be exploring. It would save the people we treat a lot of problems. It isn't going to hold for all people, but there will be people who will actually respond in this way and won't need ECT, won't need other drugs or whatever. But it doesn't suit industry's interests, not because it can't be standardized, but industry figure they really want you to take be taking a pill a day or some therapy a day or weekly in a therapy package that involves possibly psychotherapy as well for the rest of your life. As Goldman Sachs said a few years ago, and again, I can give you the reference if you want, uh, curing people is not a good business model. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I don't know if there's time for everybody, but um, thank you so much for the interesting and useful talk. Um, and yeah, I think that, um, well, I just, I guess I had a lot of different thoughts, but um, I guess one thought is about the American Psychiatric Association and the annual conferences and the advertising that goes on and the potential for like propaganda and sort of a trusting public that in, in us that sort of um, benefits it doesn't really feel the harms of prescribing medication that doesn't really necessarily help, but um, helps companies or helps us, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that type of thing and propaganda within the American Psychiatric yeah. Association or conferences. Yeah, no, I do a few thoughts. One is I'm not big on conflicts of interest. I don't think uh, they are the, I mean, there's a, there are thing, there are low hanging fruit you can point to and blame the problems on. Uh, I've had links to all of the major companies, been a consultant for all of them. So, you know, it hasn't shaped the views that I'm offering you now today. Uh, I think behind it, a more important principle is the issue about do we have access to the clinical trial data? And we don't. And the point behind uh, the restoring study three to, I mean, all the literature across medicine in company trials is ghost written. And even the ghost writers don't have access to the data and FDA don't have access to the data. And that's an important point. When you get access to the data, you realize doing a scientific kind of experiment, that is treating people, often raises more questions than it gives answers. We are being told that the articles in the New England Journal of Medicine and things like that are the tablets being brought down from, from at the mountaintop which we hear about in, at an APA meeting and the message is you've got to, you know, uh, uh, comply with these 10 rules. That's not what the scientific literature is. It opens up a space or should be opening up a space for us to ask questions. But behind all that, again, I've been left with the issue which has come up in this talk and it's going to come up in more detail in a further talk I'm going to give, which is that I think it's not just access to the data. I think we've got to stop thinking that RCTs always provide answers and get to a place which is much more that can be awfully useful, but they may raise more questions and certainly a lot of questions that the pharmaceutical companies don't want you to start asking. Um, so, you know, yeah, I, and at stake in all this is not just the health of the patients we treat, but the survival of medicine as a profession. Well, we, we do have to wrap up. Unfortunately, you have certainly raised more questions for us uh, as we go forward. And I thank you for that um, very much. Thanks for asking me, Paul. It's been good to um, give this talk. And I'm open to getting any emails from any of you. I'll be giving the slides and the text to Paul, but I'm also open to any of you getting in touch with me if uh, you have further questions. And not just questions, but if you've got things that you think uh, could be useful to throw into the mix. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Okay, okay. Take care. Bye.